Hello and welcome to the video research workshop, Discursive Software for Video Research. I'm Andrea Langrish, Managing Director for the Center for C-SPAN Scholarship and Engagement. This workshop is hosted by the Center for C-SPAN Scholarship and Engagement and the Advanced Methods at Purdue in the Behavioral, Health and Social Sciences. I'm happy to introduce Dr. Robert Browning, who is the Faculty Director of the Center for C-SPAN Scholarship and Engagement. Dr. Browning. Well, thank you, thank you, Andrea. We're excited to have you all here today. This is one of our workshops. We decided that there are lots of ways that people need to learn how to use the video library. And so we've invited people who you've been experienced users to conduct workshops for us on topics that uh, would be helpful for others. And so if you have an idea of another workshop idea, in the spring, we're going to focus a little bit on video analysis because a lot of the analysis we've done is textual analysis, but we want to show some people doing video and audio analysis as part of it. So that's my introduction by way of, of uh, the topics. And uh, so we look forward to hearing from Allison today. And so I'll turn it back to you, Andrea. Thank you, Dr. Browning. So today our featured scholar is Dr. Allison Novak. She's an associate professor at Rowan University in Glasboro, New Jersey. Dr. Novak received her PhD in communication, culture, and media from Drexel University. Her work examines political engagement, discursive construction of policy, and digital media. She is the author of three books, Network Neutrality and Digital Dialogic, Communication, Media, Millennials, and Politics, and The New Review Economy. Her work is featured in Wired Magazine, NBC News, and BBC Radio. Welcome, Dr. Novak. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to share some of the work that I was able to complete with the help of C-SPAN archives and the digital library. And I'm really looking forward to having a really engaging session today. So I just want to start by saying anyone who would like me to repeat something or reshow something, or if there's a specific topic that you think would be interesting to, fo interesting to focus on, please let me know. I'm happy to, to work through that um, in real time with you. Um, I think I've my first C-SPAN conference was in 2015. So I feel like um, I've had quite a few projects at this point that have focused on C-SPAN um, and a lot of the data that has been uh, freely available through it. Um, and what I thought I would do today is demo in vivo through a project that I completed um, just about two years ago now, which was looking primarily at net neutrality, which is a series of policies that have changed dramatically over the past 10 years. Um, and so with the help of C-SPAN and the archives, we were able to take a look at how discourses around net neutrality and policies around net neutrality have really changed um, during that period of time. So that's what I'm going to be demoing today. But like I said, if at any point you're like, I'm sick of hearing the words net neutrality, or there's some topic that's more of interest to you, please let me know. I'm happy to, to pivot and take a look at something like that. Um, at the same time. So um, I'll just start by sharing my screen here. And I do have a very boring PowerPoint to start us off, but it's just so that we can all be on the same page with um, the language that I'm gonna be using, just in case anyone's not familiar with some of the terminology. Um, that way, when I start demoing it, it kind of makes a little bit more sense. So hopefully this gives a little bit of context to what we're um, gonna be talking about. So. All right, so as mentioned, I'm gonna be demoing today um, InVivo Pro. I'm gonna be using the 12th edition of InVivo, which is a, um, a software program that allows you to complete textual analysis, primarily using qualitative um, research techniques. Uh, InVivo is, I believe, just about 10 years old as well as a software program. I'll start saying there is a free version. In fact, it's the exact version I'm going to demo for you today, version 12, that you can download for a 14-day trial. Um, and then if you love that, um, you can download and uh, pay for either a subscription or a in perpetuity license. Um, I know a lot of schools also offer um, free licenses through their um, IRT offices, so it might be something worth checking into because you may already have access to something like this. Um, 
So ultimately what I'm going to be demoing is something called discourse analysis, um, which is my chosen methodological approach to textual analysis. Um, discourses are essentially these big narratives that weave throughout the way that we talk about something. Discourses help us sort of explain complicated issues. So oftentimes we rely on them when we're trying to make sense of something. So a couple of years ago, I did a project um, that looked at how members of Congress talked about Netflix, um, which is at this point, obviously everyone's favorite streaming platform. Um, and it was something that members of Congress actually referenced quite a bit because anytime they had to explain a technical policy to their constituents or try to advocate for that policy, they would kind of throw these like fun Netflix examples because they knew everybody could kind of relate to it because everybody's had like the, the buffering experience with Netflix or you want to watch something and it won't load. Um, and so that's that's a discourse, right? Using Netflix as an example um, to either persuade your audience or to explain something to your audience. That's one example of what you can use the software to do and ultimately what a discourse can do in our society. Um, it can also, discourses can also help us explain controversies. So a couple of years ago, I did a project looking at how members of Congress use the word scandal. Um, and so what they applied that to, how they um, sort of uh, described it or defined it. And that again, allowed us to take a look at discourses because there's different ways that you can apply that terminology and those discourses have a lot of meaning when you're attempting to explain something that perhaps is uh, has ethical implications or policy implications or political implications to it. Um, discourses can also be found in breaking news or updates. Um, a little later today, I'll show you um, an example of how you can use in vivo to analyze Twitter data sets and actually compare what you find in the Twitter data sets to what you find on C-SPAN. Um, so anytime you see people talking about sharing information, especially news um, style of information, the choices we use in terms of language, the, the uh, patterns of speech that we use, the terms of references, those all have discourses with them. And then finally, ultimately, if anytime we're trying to persuade the audience, we rely on those discourses to accomplish it. So the technique that is actually being used here is actually called critical discourse analysis or just sort of in fun terms, discourse analysis. Um, Generally, it's a qualitative technique, and which means it's really best for um, times when you're researching something that is either brand new or previous codes that had been developed are just not going to apply. So, for example, if you're studying the way members of Congress have talked about Netflix, there's not a lot of research on that topic that exists. There's no existing code book for you to just import um, that you can you know, apply to it. So you need a qualitative method because it allows you for that open coding that allows you to look for what's there without having to go in with these preset categories. Um, it's also really great if you wanna compare um, different modalities. Like I said, if you wanted to compare Twitter data to C-SPAN videos, in a quantitative sense, that's there's no common denominator there. It can be hard to make comparisons. But in a qualitative way, you can make those comparisons because you're looking for those patterns, not necessarily counting instances of those patterns. Um, and finally, it's also really great for interactive communication. Um, probably the most common use of in vivo is not textual analysis in the way I'm gonna show it. It's actually in um, interview data. And so, um, in vivo can transcribe interviews for you and then you can analyze those interviews in there. Critical discourse analysis is great for any time you have those interactive conversations and you can perhaps want to analyze with how those interactions produce meaning. And then finally, it's also really great for text pulled from video, which is great because that's exactly what C-SPAN is also great at. So these two things work really well together. Um, in order to complete it, you do need a couple of things. First, you need transcripts. Um, and this is something that I'll show today how to pull from C-SPAN and, and import into InVivo pretty easily, actually. Um, although there's other ways that you can um, come up with transcripts, including like writing them yourself if you're not uh, happy with the closed captioning data that's provided. You also generally need information about who the speaker is. So in vivo is not great if it's a crowded room and you just got random people who are talking over each other. Even if you have a transcript of that, you need to have, be able to document the speaker in some way. Um, and then in order to complete critical discourse analysis, it does help to have some software like what we're going to show today. So as I said, um, the program is actually called InVivo Pro 12, um, just lovingly known as InVivo in the critical discourse community. 
Um, and I've got just a great quote that sort of gives a description of what we're going to be showing today. It helps you discover more from your qualitative and mixed methods research data and uncovers insights by producing clearly articulated, defensible findings backed by rigorous evidence. So there are some automated um, tools that I'm going to demonstrate today that will allow you to produce research outputs very quickly and very easily that can help um, when you're ultimately writing up your findings for a chapter or for a conference presentation or other types of publications. Um, and Vivo is also great because it's just frankly a really good storage space for your data. So I have all sorts of data sets that I have not analyzed yet, but if you're the type of person who likes to collect things and you're like, oh, this would be interesting, and then you have to move on to a new project or something like that, in vivo helps you store that data without having to worry about, you know, is it going to be bogging down Excel spreadsheets or something like that. And as I said before, there's all sorts of free versions of this if this is something that speaks to you and you want to explore more. So finally, last thing we'll talk about is just the process of in vivo. In vivo ultimately works in the process called open coding. Basically, what this is best for is when you have an example of a data set that doesn't have an existing code book that might apply to it. So like I said, if there's no previous research done on this particular topic, then you probably need open coding in order to find out what's actually being said or how things are being discursively constructed in that data set. And the nice thing about discourse analysis is it doesn't limit you in terms of what those codes might be. So sometimes in content analysis, we get limited to specific words or specific instances. Discourse analysis doesn't have that problem. You might look for themes. Terms of reference are one of my favorite things to look for in discourse analysis. Um, so if you see someone referring to another politician as corrupt, that's a term of reference. Anytime somebody uses a nickname for another candidate or if they're, let's say, they're they're talking back and forth and they're fighting, if they use kind of a, um, a nickname that insinuates something about their personality or them that's a term of reference. If they talk about an organization and they're like, this is a green company, that's a term of reference. So that's something you can find pretty easily within Vivo. And again, discourse analysis really helps with. Um, we also have patterns of persuasion we can identify. So rhetorical devices can be pretty easily identified using in Vivo. Um, and again, that's just something you would find using open coding. Uh, topics. So I'll show you today how to figure out what are some of the most common words used by members of Congress, um, not just like the and of, but actual topical words. And those topics really help um, illustrate what things they continuously focus back on, what policies are perhaps nearest and dearest to their heart, or the ones that they're trying to promote the most. And then finally, we can find um, lots of examples. So today I'll show a lot of examples of um, when members of Congress invoke small businesses in order to um, advocate their position on particular policy. This tends to be a, a really common technique because they know small businesses um, are generally very engaged members of the electorate, or at least people who own them. And as a result, they like to invoke them a lot in speeches because they know that this is a particular type of outreach that might really um, resonate with that audience. So basically, you create a code for these things, you read the transcript every time you see the something in the transcript that meets one of these interests. You click on it, you highlight it, and then Vivo stores that for you and then helps you at the end sort of produce an analysis of all of that. So that's the open coding process. That's the whole thing that we're going to do with in Vivo. And so that's where I'll stop my very boring PowerPoint today. And um, I will now pivot talking a little bit about the actual program and showing you an example of a data set um, that I pulled and then we'll pull our own. We'll come up with the, some of the ones that are most interest to you. So let's see. All right, so this is what Invivo looks like when you first open it. Um, it usually just lives on a little icon on your, on your desktop. And when you open it, you have a lot of options. Um, if you're ever in a position where you have teach this to students. I actually think there's a lot of great projects in the sample project um, where people have volunteered data um, from their own work that students can kind of explore and manipulate and learn from. Um, there is actually a C-SPAN data set in the sample project. So if you're teaching uh, like a qualitative research methods course or any type of real political science course, this might be something to demo. Um, but in general, if you are starting your own research project, you are going to start a blank project. And we will do that in a little bit. But first, I'm going to show you what we're working towards um, with an existing data set that I've produced here. 
So I'm going to open up a data set that I used for um, a book that I wrote with a colleague a couple of years ago, which was specifically on net neutrality. Um, net neutrality, as I said before, has had a lot of changes in the past 10 years or so, which means there's been a lot of congressional speeches about it, despite the fact that most of the time Congress is not really responsible for those changes. Really, net neutrality is a policy that is overseen by the FCC. So there's a lot of talk about it, but there's actually only a handful of bills that have ever been introduced on this particular topic, which kind of gives it this unique place where it's something of interest. There's generally a lot of audience engagement on this topic, but members of Senate don't really have a lot of ability to control it. Although that's certainly not how they are going to position themselves when they're talking about this topic. Um, so in 2018, um, there was a bill introduced by Senator Markey of Massachusetts to reinstate net neutrality. Basically, I'll give you the short version of it. In 2014, the Open Internet Order was established, which was going to confirm and reinforce the power of net neutrality in the United States. Net neutrality is this policy that allows or I'm sorry, requires um, internet service providers to give you access to any website, any platform, basically as fast as it possibly can um, based on what you're paying for it. So it can't say, okay, we're Comcast and we're currently fighting with Netflix, so we're gonna slow Netflix down, although that is a very real example of something that happened. Um, so net neutrality says that's not allowed, like they are not allowed to slow down an individual platform or organization. So 2014, this is um, something that is established as a formalized policy. It had been the law of the land up until that point because of policies from 1996, but it was basically confirmed, reinforced, and made a little bit stronger at that time. Um, when Donald Trump was elected president, he appointed um, a previous commissioner of the FCC who promised to eliminate net neutrality. And in 2017, he did just that. So they repealed that policy in 2017. And at that time, you may have seen some protest about this. There was a day of action that went alongside it. Um, the FCC commenting system famously crashed twice during this because of sort of um, collective action movement around this. So all of this led to 2018, which is when the senators really get involved. Um, and that is why the data set that you see in front of you um, essentially has all of the speeches that were made by members of Sen the Senate in 2018, and then a couple from uh, the representatives. I'm gonna show you how to add in just a few moments. So you see here that we've got a, a healthy mix, more Democrats than Republicans of our 2018 senators who spoke on net neutrality. Um, and so this chapter from this book essentially looked at what were members of the Senate saying at this time, in particular because they had just introduced a bill um, by Senator Markey to basically reinstate it, to, so it override what had happened by the FCC in 2017. So what I've done here is I've preloaded all of these from the C-SPAN archives. So any one of these that we click on, we're going to just start with Senator Blumenthal. He's a Democrat from Connecticut. We can just click on it. It might take a second to open, but um, what you see here is a speech that he gave. And it's essentially what you see when you go on C-SPAN and you click on mentions and you search for um, Senator Blumenthal and net neutrality, this is what comes up. This is what he had to say about that proposed bill coming from Senator Markey. And so you can see, it's basically a pretty short speech that he gave um, as a member of Congress. And this is really him trying to support it. You actually see an example of Netflix. So I promise that would be something that really does happen quite a bit. They oftentimes use Netflix as an example. There it right is. We've got a lot of other organizations that are talked about here. We've got small businesses that are mentioned down here. So all of these are sort of important aspects of um, his speech. So any one of these I've preloaded in here so we can take a look at another um, senator and we'll open up his. All right, so we've got a South Dakota Republican senator similarly speaking on this. Um, he was opposed to the bill that um, Senator Markey had introduced. So that alone allows us to sort of archive some of these mentions of net neutrality. That's great. That's something that NVivo allows us to do. And like I said, Sometimes I just download data sets because I think it might be interesting or something I want to write about in the future and I don't have time to analyze it right now. This is what NVivo allows you to do is just kind of archive it. Later on, I can open up this file and say, this is a topic that I now have time to pay attention to. 
So the first thing that generally you do when you have some of these data points are that you start to classify these different types of data. Um, and so I've chosen to classify them based on if they are Democratic senators or Republican senators. Um, it was all during the same year. Um, you could also choose to um, classify if they're senior or junior members of Congress. You might do it by state. You might do it by um, individual sessions of Congress should um, you be collecting over multiple years. There's all sorts of ways that you can choose to classify your data. This is a pretty small data set for us to just get started with, but let's say you wanted to download every speech that had been said about net neutrality since 2010, which is really some of the first congressional mentions we see of it. You might see how there may be a lot of file classifications that you might use there. So that alone, that helps us sort of sort the data and see what's there. And so I can pull up just what the Democratic senators are saying. I can pull up just what the Republican senators are saying. And like I said, in a few moments, I'll show you how to import the representatives because in 2019, they have a lot to say as a response to this. So, so far, that's our first in vivo step is to come up with file classifications, which essentially tell us what each one of these are going to be. All right, so the next thing we can do is now we can actually start reading through these transcripts and seeing if we can find anything that might be relevant or patterns that suggest larger discourses at play. And remember, there's a couple of different things that we're looking for. I like to think of a discourse in this way as a theme. So what themes continuously show up again and again across these members of Congress speeches? And we'll probably start to see some differences between the members of Congress who are Democrats and Republicans, often they invoke different themes. We will definitely see differences between the, um, the members of the Senate and the House of Representatives um, because they also tend to have different um, uh, constituencies and responsibilities. So again, there will be differences in themes there. So let's just read through and we'll start here with Senator Blumenthal, who's already open. All right. So we'll see, start off with his beginning of his speech here. And I'll just point out because these are the closed captioning um, from C-SPAN, you may notice typos, you may notice capitalizations that might be off. You may look at things and be like, that's not a word. That's okay, that's just the closed captioning. Sometimes there's errors in it. That's the beauty of qualitative research is because we're not counting on a word by word basis. It's okay if not every word carried over perfectly because we're not counting it. So we're just looking for general meaning here. We're not trying to figure out numerically what's happening. So he starts off, Mr. President, only in Washington, D.C., and perhaps only in the walls of this capital is net neutrality regarded as a partisan issue. Now, I happen to know from this data set that partisan politics show up again and again and again. They talk about this as a partisan issue, and many members of the Senate in particular say this really shouldn't be partisan, but they continuously go back to this idea over and over. So right there, I'm like, oh, I see something about partisan here. We've got in the next sentence, only here accusations that the left or the right favorite a position on net neutrality. The rest of America and net neutrality is bipartisan, non-political, and the lifeblood of the internet. So it's kind of like his opening. It's his lead in his speech. And he's decided to focus in the lead of his speech on partisanship. And this idea is particular as could this policy really be partisan? And he's challenging me saying, really, it's not the case outside of here. So that's something, we know there's something there. He chose to start a speech with it. We know that's gonna be important, I suspect, and I know that it's gonna show up in other people's speeches as well. So I'm just gonna highlight it. So I'm gonna highlight that sentence because I'm gonna say, I'm gonna to wanna to come back to that. I know we're gonna see something about partisan uh, politics elsewhere. I wanna be able to see this in context to that other partisan quote. So I'm gonna click on it. I'm gonna highlight it, click on it with my right mouse click. And I'm just gonna click code. And it's gonna open up a code book for me. Now, because this is a pre-populated data set, you'll actually see the codes that I've already loaded in here. And I know that partisan politics was something that happened quite frequently in these speeches. So all I have to do is click on it because it already exists. I say, this is gonna go in my bucket of partisan politics quotes. And at the end of our analysis, we're gonna look at all the different ways that they talk about partisan politics. So I click on that. Let's say that it was something that was brand new. You can see it kind of shows up over here. It reminds me that it's been moved. So you still see it here. It's now highlighted. It's now also going to show up if I go over to my code book. I can see all the things that I know are going to be there. I click on partisan politics. It may take a second to open. 
And here we go. We've got our very first quote from Senator Blumenthal. And so we've also got other people who have already pre-coded and said, these are also quotes about partisan politics that are going to, so you'll see those in just a few minutes and I'll actually give you an opportunity to see if you can code some of the statements and see if you can figure out what they go to. So right there, we can already start to see in vivo working, right? So we've got a code that we selected. We found a quote that we think fits that code and we've put it in that bucket and we already can compare it to what else other people are saying. So Blumenthal is talking about partisan politics. Senator Thune is also gonna talk about partisan politics. He's gonna do it three times actually. So you're gonna see it quite a bit in his speech. So let's go back and let's go back talking about Senator Blumenthal. All right, so we get to our next sentence here. And now he's going to go into a definition of uh, net neutrality. And this is actually pretty important because net neutrality is in general kind of a tricky concept. It is not, does not sound good. It is not something that people are like, oh yes, I get that, right? This is not like taxes. This isn't something that people see on a daily basis. And because of that, most of these senators in their speeches are going to have to define it. They are going to have to explain it a little bit. And they oftentimes do it very early in their speeches. And it's kind of intriguing when you see their definitions because they're all slightly different from each other. They're picking different things to emphasize. So I know that's something we're also gonna wanna compare is how are they defining this issue? And I would encourage anyone who's doing policy research to if you especially have a policy that isn't immediately obvious, this is something that you could e easily look at in your own work is how is that member of Congress or the Senate um, particularly looking at the definition. So, so we're gonna do the exact same thing we did before. So it is the animating principle that enables companies and individuals to have equal access to the internet without blocking, discriminating, price gouging, or favoring some companies at the expense of others. There's a fun fact for you that is also the definition on Wikipedia. So we know where he got this from. Um, and so we're just gonna, again, do the exact same thing. So highlight it, right mouse click, click code, and again, I know that everybody has to define it at some point. So we just click on that one. And now it's over in our definition. So you can go back, double check, make sure it went there, just make sure everything happened. I'm gonna click on this. So we've got, again, Senator Blumenthal, we've got his example of it and something else that I've already coded here. So this is Senator Thune, similarly talking about the definition. He's actually going to do it in kind of the opposite way. He's going to say, it's not this, it's not this. Um, so two different approaches, but similar outcome providing a definition. So we could do this with the entirety of Senator Blumenthal's speech. Um, and so you see here, it could go on for quite some time. Um, some of these speeches are very short. I'm going to show you an example in a little bit of a speech that is extremely long from a member of the House. Um, and so depending on how big that data set is, this is essentially the process you would use to code it. Let's say I find something though that isn't yet in my code book. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. That's a brand new thing. I wanna check and see if it's somewhere else, if there's any other speeches that mention it. So I said before Netflix, right? So a lot of uh, members of Congress use Netflix as this really personal, relatable example when they're trying to make people understand uh, complicated policy. So I say, okay, Netflix, awesome, let's code it. Let's see who else mentions Netflix. Um, this is also particularly relevant in this case because Netflix is one of the only organizations to successfully sue over a net neutrality violation. They sued Comcast um, in about 2012. And as a result of that, it's relevant that they would be used as an example here, but perhaps almost invoked, not fully explained the context of. So I look and I go, oh my goodness, I don't have anything specifically about Netflix, but it is kind of a corporate example, right? It kind of fits this larger code that we might have. So we'll see, oh, I don't have anything about Netflix in particular. So I probably need to add a code, right? I need to add something about Netflix. I have a feeling it's gonna show up in some of these other um, speeches as well. So I just click new code, I'm sorry, new node. <laughs> and we're gonna put it right here under corporate example. So you click that, I want it to sort of show up as a sub data point. And you just click save and now it's under node. So now if I go over here, I can see corporate examples. If I want, I can see examples of small businesses anytime they talk about small businesses. So Senator Blumenthal likes to talk about small businesses, makes sense. He was an uh, AG before he was in Congress. Um, and then we've got now our Netflix example as well. 
So that just takes us through one speech. We can do this with all of the speeches that we have here. Um, and as you add those codes, so for example, we can pull up Senator Nelson. You'll see this is a little bit harder to read and I'll show you how to fix that in just a second. Um, but as you go through and you attempt to make sense of what Senator Nelson is saying, all of those codes that you identify will show back up in those notes that we were just talking about. So as I mentioned, sometimes when you import things from the C-SPAN library, you just get the closed captioning data. And that data is excellent, um, but sometimes it is in all caps, and that makes it very difficult to read, especially if you need to have vision problems like I do. So there's an easy way to fix some of this, and I will show you very quickly how to do that. Um, and it actually involves good old Microsoft Word. You do not actually need to do um, any programming in order to do that. So the first thing you do is you just click to edit it. I highlight the whole thing and I copy it. And then I pull up a Word document. I pull it in here and I copy it in. So it's about a page and a half. That's a lot. So I'm gonna highlight it again. I'm just gonna put it over into a normal, I'm gonna remove the formatting of it. So normal um, sort of formatting. And then I'm gonna change it to sentence case. And all of a sudden it's a lot easier to read. Now, is it perfect? Absolutely not. For example, you can see things that are proper nouns that should be capitalized kind of lose their capitalization. But at the end of the day, if you're coding speeches and you're reading all caps for hours and hours, you will eventually lose your vision. So you wanna use a program like this in order to make it a little bit easier on your eyes. So again, copy it right back into Vivo. And I'm just gonna replace everything that went in there. And now it's a little bit easier to manipulate and to read um, as well. So that's just uh, an easy hint here. So this is, I believe, I'm trying to remember who we opened. This is Senator Nelson. Um, and so Senator Nelson is going to similarly use examples here. So he's got school children in his state. We've got um, educators. Um, so you can kind of read through and identify what he is in particular talking about here. All right, any questions so far? I'll just take a quick second. I saw somebody posted it in the chat here. Oh, codes and nodes, great question. So codes basically are the big category um, and nodes are really what we're talking about when we get to discourses. So it is confusing because they rhyme, but a code is basically think about a code book. When you use a code book and you're doing um, any type of content analysis, a code allows you to say, okay, this is the type of data that I am looking for. The node is the type. The code is like the list of types that you're using. Um, so you only have one code book. Um, actually, the nice thing about InVivo is your code book is um, exportable. So I'm going to show you actually downloaded um, the nodes from, this was the code book. So if you, let's say, were going to be presenting at a conference, or publishing, you can download your code book and anything that you have listed there will show up. You don't even have to make this chart. It just downloads for you. You put it in as an appendix. Um, and as long as you've inserted a description, which you can see I've done for some of them, but not all of them, then you'll get um, a nice rich table that it produces. All right, so we'll go back over. So most of the time though, in NVivo, especially for textual analysis, you'll be using nodes um, to do that. So I have added a few that I know exist within um, the data set that we're looking for here. So a lot of times uh, when members of Congress talk about policies, they talk about it in terms of the consequences that might happen, both if a policy is set or ignored or if the issue is um, changed. So we've got consequences in there. And I also happen to know that they like to talk about the word monopoly a lot anytime they talk about net neutrality. So anytime we saw the word monopoly or reference, the idea of monopoly reference, um, I pulled that. And so you can see examples from four different senators here who um, talk about monopolies, uh, monopolistic power or behavior um, as a part of their speeches. We already talked about the corporate examples. So sometimes we'll see senators refer to like Netflix as a big example, um, but most often we'll see small businesses. So anytime you code for that, you'll see that there. Definitions, uh, we already talk, saw an example of, but especially when you've got complicated policies, definitions tend to be something that show up. Um, I also know that there's a lot of mentions about the relationship um, between the Senate and the FCC, which 
Um, for the senators in particular who are speaking, um, they are not particularly supportive of the FCC as it was being led at that time. And so there's uh, some references to the, the damaged relationship between the FCC and what is the power of the Senate over the FCC, which they really don't have any. But there's a lot of debate and discussion over what that should be and what that relationship should look like. Um, I also happen to see a lot of um, the members of Senate refer to Ob uh, net neutrality as the Obama era policy. That's one of those terms of reference that we mentioned. Um, so it's not just like it's a policy, it's the Obama policy, um, which is designed obviously to carry meaning and to be persuasive depending on if you're supportive or um, opposed to Barack Obama. And then again, that references to partisan politics, which we already talked about a little bit and saw some examples of. So I thought it'd be fun to pull up um, a shorter speech, which members of Senate are not known for their short speeches. So I pulled up a member of the House of Representatives who had a shorter speech. And I thought maybe what we could do is just an interactive, um, let's read through it and see if you can find any codes or any nodes that you think would be of interest or you wanna see if they exist elsewhere. So I'm gonna pull up um, an interesting example of this. This is Representative Jeff Andrew from my area, in, well, actually not my area, but from the area next to my area in New Jersey. Um, Van Drew um, is sort of famous for changing um, his political affiliation partway through um, President Trump's tenure. He was a Democratic representative. He is now a Republican representative. So what's interesting about his speech is in 2019, he is in favor of net neutrality. And in 2020, he is not. Um, so he's got a pretty short speech in 2019. I'm going to give you a second to read through it. See if you can find any of those examples of nodes that we just talked about, or if you see something new that you think would be of interest here. So I keep seeing, like, they're talking about economic opportunities and mm -hmm. the information economy. Yes, definitely. So the economic opportunities, they use the word economic engine quite a bit also, um, which tends to be a buzz term that we see. Um, so yeah, let's code for it. So we see economic um, education, economic opportunities. So let's code this. We'll take the two sentences here. And maybe we need a new code, which I accidentally created earlier. So we will rename this one, economic. And now it's over there. Perfect. Anybody see any others that maybe already exist or? I'm gonna pick on Juanita. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Juanita, did you see anything in this paragraph that jumped out as you, um, as one of the, the codes that she was referring to, that Allison was referring to? I guess, I don't know, Americans, it's almost like they relate it to your citizenship almost. Mm, that's a great observation. Know. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of references to the country, but then as you said, uh, the type of engaged citizenship and what that engaged citizenship should look like. So being a good American means listening to, um, you know, political discourse about a certain topic or paying attention to controversial issues. Uh, which is actually like a new way of us conceptualizing citizenship. Historically, citizenship has been performance based. It's been like voting and maybe volunteering for an organization. Now it's about paying attention and that attention economy. So that's a great observation. And you're right, they do sort of invoke that quite a bit in here. Is there a sentence where you see that sort of talked about quite a bit? Also, um, Vivo will remind you to save things if you don't, so that's <laughs> helpful. With the one where it says, uh, starts from, from educational and economic opportunities to political organizing, it, what after that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. and so that, let's, mm -hmm. we'll code for that first and then we'll add to it. So we probably need a new node here. So we'll just call it this engine. All right. And I think, I don't know about you, Juanita, but I think right here, it's an information economy, right? Is that what you're thinking of yes. also? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That access to the internet almost as like giving you the American way. The that way, one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It's nice, nice finding there. So definitely we'll put it right in there. So citizenship, all right. And I'll just point out one other code that I uh, that we see here. So he also references bipartisanship, um, which is, 
considering he's pretty much one of the only people to change his political affiliation partway through the past few years. He's a, an interesting example of someone being like bipartisanship, but also I'm gonna change my own identity here. So we'll just code for that because we know already that that's something that shows up quite a bit in these policy debates here. So as you can see, um, from this particular data set, we can start to analyze all these different types of speeches um, that may come from our senators. But as we're seeing, there might be some differences between our House of Representatives and the Senate. And so we may want to add to this data set, right? We may say to ourselves, okay, it was interesting to see what the Senate said, but like now we're getting some really interesting complexities coming out of the House. So what if we added some uh, data points to this? And that's what we're gonna do right now. If we're gonna go into C-SPAN and we're gonna pull some mentions from our members of the House in 2019 so that we can do more of this comparison. So we can see if Juanita is right, that they are referencing citizenship more and maybe the Senate wasn't doing that, which kind of makes sense considering the differences and with their responsibilities. So I'll pull up the C-SPAN video library here. Um, and so just start by showing um, a quick way to add a mention in. And I'm going to start by also acknowledging that there is a better way to do this. Um, so Robert, don't, don't panic. I promise I'm going to show off the API <laughs> in just a second. Um, but I think it's helpful to do like the manual version of it. And then we'll do the, um, the API version after that. So the first thing we probably want to do is search for net neutrality. That's basically the topic that we're looking for here. And we're particularly interested in House of Representatives in 2019, which is them responding to the 2018 bill of Senator Markey. So we're gonna to go to mentions because that's really where we get that closed captioning data. And we already know the year that we're looking for, so we can narrow it down a little bit further. We say it's 2019. And right now we have 911 mentions in the video library of net neutrality in 2019. It was a big year for net neutrality. So that's too many, right? That's going to be an intense data set for us to work through in this really qualitative, critical way. So what we're going to do is instead, we're going to go to event type. And we're going to narrow this down quite a bit. And we're going to take a look at basically the places where it's talked about the most, which happens to be the House. So we're going to look at the House proceedings from 2019, where there are mentions of net neutrality. Um, and we click that button, and now it narrows it down to us to 56 mentions in these House proceedings. Um, and so there's Jeff Andrew, the example that we just saw. There's his 2019 speech that I pulled into um, in vivo already. Um, you can see, scroll down and you can see all the different other speeches. Um, I'm going to show you a couple examples here. And we're going to start with Barbara Lee, um, who is a member of the House from California. She's a Democrat. I should point out that California is an interesting example. And this is one of those times where that file classification might be interesting because almost all the members of the House from California at some point have talked about net neutrality. They have clearly used this as a, a policy issue that the state is trying to designate itself as a leader on. Um, and so this is a time where maybe it's not just the Republicans versus the Democrats, maybe it's what is California saying about that? Um, and so it might be interesting um, if for anybody who's thinking of this type of research to do it themselves. So I'm gonna pull up, and I already preloaded it here. This is Barbara Lee's speech. As you know, we can watch her speech, we could clip her speech, um, but right now we are just going to pull the transcript in of her speech and add it to in vivo so that we could do the analysis. And then I'm gonna show you what is possibly my favorite member of House Representative speech on net neutrality, which is just exquisite. So we're gonna see him right after we see Barbara Lee. So Barbara Lee, you can seek, uh, we seek her out. When we clicked on her name um, here, it pulls this up right away. We can show full text. It's not a very long speech and that's most of the house is pretty short compared to what we see coming from the Senate. So I'm going to add her to our data set. So I go back over to in vivo and I want to add a file. If I remember how to do this. Let's see. So we that right mouse click on files to add her um, speech to our data set. We're going to say new file, and it's basically a new document. That's what we are creating on her behalf. 
So I'm going to go back over to Invivo and I'm just going to copy her information right over. And I'm going to scroll down in order to do this because I know that over here it gives us a massive list of all the people who spoke during this house session. And so this is an easy thing for us to uh, use because it's already got where she's from, her uh, affiliation. And I should also point out importantly, it's their affiliation at that moment, which if you've got someone like Van Drew who changes the year later, it classifies him as a Democrat here and a Republican later on. And that helps you just sort of like, I remember, okay, is he being a Democrat or Republican in this particular speech? So, um, so we just need to find her. Here's Barbara Lee. So we are going to copy her information in here. All right. And I'm gonna say 2019, that's just for me so that I can visualize when all of this is happening. And we're going to say, okay, just make sure I didn't accidentally add anything. Um, first thing we want to do is to change her classification. She is a Democratic House of Represent member of the House of Representatives. So I go down here and I'm just going to change it so that now anytime I click on the Democratic House of Representatives, there she is. So we automatically have her. So let's go back and we are going to add her speech in once again. We've got a great speech here, but it is in all caps and it will make you go blind. So we write that, we co copy it, we put it into Word. That is rough looking. And so we just change it to sentence case, copy it back in, and just like that. Now you've got her speech in there and you are ready to code. So we can take a look here. We see here we've got an immediate definition right that is an interesting finding we already know definitions are key to this work so we code we can put her in definitions we've got a relationship between the fcc we've got legislation versus the fcc the fcc has to stop abusive practices so again another code that we already knew was going to be there we just found it in her speech so we're going to code for it we've got a government and fcc relationship that's happening there um, and essentially that takes us to the end of her speech. She does speak rather quickly. All right, so we've got, that was Barbara Lee. So that gives us a little bit of insight. Like I said, you could do this with all the members of the house from California. All of them have spoken in many times, multiple cases on this. So you could see how are they really working together to present this issue and construct this issue. All right, so as promised, I promised to show you my favorite um, set of speeches on net neutrality, which comes from the house in 2019 here. And this is something that we can again input into it. And this comes to us from a member of the house from Texas, this is Louis Gomert. And he talks for a long time. He talks for so long. He talks, I believe he goes all the way from 324 to well past 347. And at the very end of his speech, he goes, how much time do I have left? And the entire faces of people are like, no more time. You have no more time to stop. Because he's on such a tangent. He's so in the weeds and he has no idea that he just talked for a half an hour. As a professor, I can relate to that. Sometimes you're like, oh, we have, you know, 20 minutes left and we have no time left. Um, but he, he does this in a very public way. So we're gonna take a look at his speech. Just like the really short one that we just saw from Barbara, we are now going to see a very long version of this. And so we're going to show his full text. And as promised, it is very, very long. And this is just the first half of it because it's in two sets of mentions. So it keeps going. I, yeah, I told you it's a really, for house speech, you know, it's a long speech. And I'll show you at the very end here, it's still going. Because I think at one point, yeah, he said up at the top, he's like, how much time do I have left? And I'm like, you're done. And so then he wraps up for another like three minutes and then he yields, he yields back, he yields back the time that he no longer has. <laughs> so you just get some sort of classic, uh, classic house humor there. All right, so we're gonna add him to our data set just like what we just did for her. So we get a little bit more practice on this. I'm just gonna stop, I know the video I think is playing in the background. So we're gonna copy his information in there. Again, we don't have to Google it or anything like that. I just have to find it to be able to. All right, so I'll do another practice one here. You just right mouse click. We're going to be adding a file, new file, new document, and and this time he is in 2019 speaking. 
Now, we don't have any um, members of the House who are Republicans yet, so we need to add his classification to this. So let's do that right now. So I'm going to right mouse click on his name, classification, and we're going to say new file classification. So we can add it. And again, we could make this way more specific if we wanted. We could say Texas members of the House. We could um, make it specific by year. But in this case, we don't need to do any of that. We're just going to look at um, him as a House. So all right. So our Republican representatives. And so now he's all by and lonesome, but he is over here. So let's add him into our data set and we're going to get an appreciation of just how long he talks for because we are going to attempt to copy this in. This is the first half on net neutrality. So just like what we did before, Word document. And oh my goodness, it's multiple pages long. All right, and we're going to right mouse click again. We're going to change our sentence case and copy it. Now, this is again half of his speech. So if we want to add to the other half of it, we're going to do that right now. So it's scrolling. And I'm going to go to the end and go up for him. And same thing we just had to do. You can see he's really in the weeds in this speech. Yeah, I don't think he's reading from anything at this point. He's he's just he's talking about all sorts of topics. He, at one point he talks about the history of the FBI. I don't know how we got there, but um, oh, and we crashed Word because it was so long. So, <laughs> so all right, we're back. Don't worry. All right, so we changed it over to normal uh, formatting. And once it does that, thinking about it. And it's loading. <laughs> well, I don't think it wants us to have the second half of Louis' speech. And we're not going to read into why Microsoft Word is telling us that, but we will just power through with the first half of his speech as if we were really going to do the analysis of it. So you get the general idea, you just add to it. It's not um, it's not another procedure. You don't have to add a new file to it. You just want to add um, to what he already has. So that takes us through sort of this first data set. You could theoretically do that with every member of the House who speaks about net neutrality um, uh, in 2019, but that would be exhausting. You'd be adding a new file for each and every instance. And the nice thing about C-SPAN is we don't have to do that. There's other ways for us to uh, import uh, several transcripts or several sets of mentions at one time. And so that's what we're going to do right now. Um, so we're going to leave the 2019 data set and take a look at how we might do this um, in, uh, uh, in like a batch style. So we're going to go over here to C-SPAN. All right, and we're back here. And let's search for net neutrality again. And let's do a slightly different type of analysis this time. So just like we did before, we're going to go to our mentions, which I understand from the recent C-SPAN conference is the preferred uh, search uh, method here for um, understanding our transcripts. Um, and so instead of saying, okay, let's look at the house in 2019, maybe let's do something instead where we take a look at um, a particular speaker. We wanna see what one person has to say on this topic throughout their entire tenure. Um, and we can think about who those speakers might be. They might be, um, you know, they might be members of the Senate or the House. They might be a president, um, but it might be really interesting for us to take a look at what the chair of the FCC has to say on this topic. And the nice thing about the two recent chairs of the FCC is they've been pretty outspoken. So they've done a lot of interviews. They have um, made a lot of digital content, for better or worse. 
and they have also spoken quite a bit on C-SPAN about this topic in both recorded sort of House and um, Senate sessions, as well as in interview shows. So let's say we want to take a look at what the most recent chair of the FCC had to say on this particular topic throughout his tenure. And we are going to download everything that he had to say every time he mentions it in one file set, rather than us having to go through and add individually to each one. So what we're going to do is we've already hit mentions and we're going to go to persons and we are going to take a look at the people who speak the most about it. Now we've already said Senator Markey, this is like his keystone issue right now. Actually, ironically, the person I co-authored this book for works for Senator Markey now on this policy. So I happen to know that this really is the thing that he's focused on quite a bit. Um, and so we see some other speakers here that are um, equally prolific on this topic, but we are going to select the former chair of the FCC. This is somebody who was a chairperson under the Obama FCC era, and then he became chair when Donald Trump was appointed and was appointed to that chair position. So this is Aja Pai. He is um, a somewhat controversial figure um, in the FCC history at this point. He's very outspoken. And as far as FCC chairs go, he has a lot of personality. This is not a position that typically um, has a very showy person in charge of it, with a few exceptions throughout history. He really um, saw himself as a figurehead of that organization. And as a result of that, his speeches and his um, communication is very engaging. It's a little bit controversial. And it's definitely something that would be worth studying is like, how is he discursively presenting this topic? Because he's not just like sitting there reading from a script. He's saying things off the cuff, which sometimes do not go over very well and earn him some, some really serious pushback in some cases, including some, some threats that he received at some points to um, the way he was handling issues. So not yeah, they're obviously not great. But we can see over the course of his tenure, um, he spoke about net neutrality 41 times um, on C-SPAN. So we have these archives of what he had to say during that time. So we are going to export all of these. We are not going to sit there and read through and decide right now what, get, what, is, what it really fits. We're just going to use this um, to our advantage and we are going to download this almost like a batch. So the first thing we do, and I did learn this from our most recent C-SPAN conference, is you hit show 41. And what this is going to do is going to show all of the things that there are transcripts of, and it allows you to download everything in one batch. If you just do the initial 20, then all you're going to download at one time is 20, and you kind of have to do it in multiple batches. So you want to start with that show 41, and then you want to click on export CSV. And if you don't have this option available on your C-SPAN, I believe you just have to go into your settings and request API access. And this will allow you to download the CFV files, which you can then just directly import into um, in vivo and perform your analysis. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to hit export CSV. We are going to download these 31 sets of transcripts here. We're going to open it up. And there it is in basically an Excel spreadsheet, um, which we're going to have to save as an Excel spreadsheet. Every time that Ajit Pai spoke on net neutrality, here is the text of what he had to say. So there's quite a bit here, as you can see, and the file itself is a fairly large one. Personally, I don't think you need every single one of these columns when you import into in vivo. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to eliminate the things that are really good for archival purposes, but don't really have a, a value for us in in vivo. So we're going to get rid of this. Uh, we know it's all Ajapai, so we can get rid of that. We know who he is. Um, person ID is specific to C-SPAN. That's how they identify him um, sort of on the back end. We don't need that either. The begin time we actually want to keep because that is when that speech was, I believe, um, put on C-SPAN or um, they were actually visualized. So we're going to keep that one. The length, we also don't really need, to, we're going to automatically have that because we're going to see how long his, he's speaking for, so we can get rid of that. I like to keep the link because if you ever want to go back and maybe see a longer version, if there was other content, keep it. Program ID, we don't really need because, again, that's specific, so we can get rid of those. And we're just going to right now click and delete all of that. And what we're going to do is now we've got these nice, long, usable categories for us. So again, we've got this issue though, of these are incredibly uh, difficult to read um, examples of our text. 
And so one of the things we're going to do is we're just going to wrap our text so it's a little more visual here. It's pretty long. All right. And so some of these were put into sentence case, some of them weren't. Um, I'm just going to put in our chat if you're the type of person um, who is interested in using Excel um, to automatically change things. There is a formula you can use to automatically transfer everything into that sentence case, just like what we just did. Um, so I'm just going to put it in there um, so that it's helpful to all of you, but we're not going to do it right now because it does take a few seconds to actually work and we don't want to crash anything. <laughs> so you would basically do something like proper and then you put the name and that changes it into its um, sentence case. So that's just a little Excel spreadsheet hack for you. All right, so this is all we had to do. Now we just want to save it. So we do file, save as. And we need to sell, save it as an Excel spreadsheet. And just keep in mind it downloads in a different format. So we want to make sure that we're, we're downloading it the right way for um, in vivo. We go over to our conference. I'm just going to save it here. And I'm just going to call this one V2. All right. So let's go back and we are going to start a new project. So we are going to leave our 2018, 2019 data set. And this time we are going to call it Ajapai Engines of Net. All right. And so we are going to open up a brand new blank project. This is what it looks like when you get started. Um, and so in vivo will walk you through everything. The nice thing is it's very user friendly. So if it's been a while, sometimes like if I go, you know, a couple months without doing a project, and I'm like, I don't remember how to upload something. It remind you the second you open a new project. But basically, we don't need to do that because we've already downloaded our data set. And all we're going to do is we're going to be importing it. So we downloaded it as a CSV file. We saved it as an Excel file. And now we just upload it to InVivo and we're going to see InVivo work some magic here um, and do some fun things telling us about Ajit Pai's speech and discourses. So I'm going to upload that file that we just downloaded from C-SPAN. And it's going to sort of give us a little step-by-step um, -step way to upload it so that it looks and does the things that we want. So essentially, this is just a reminder of all the different tools that it gives us. All right, so we've got, here's what it thinks it's uploading here. So it's telling us that it's got all these different rows. It's telling us all the different classifications. Remember, we did delete some of those um, items that C-SPAN automatically downloads because it wouldn't be helpful for us. And now you kind of get a visual of why because you don't need the program ID. It's not going to do you any good in vivo. Helpful on the C-SPAN side, just not in this analysis side. All right, so yep, we say that looks right. Those are definitely the things that we are going to be analyzing. All right. I'm just usually I accept whatever default settings are because you can always modify them later on if you need to, but most of the time in vivo is smart enough to realize like this is um, a data set that we're going to be analyzing and it's also actually instantly going to recognize which parts of it are going to be open coded and which ones are not. So it can tell that like, oh, that's just a category. We're seeing things over and over. We don't need to create an open-ended code here. The only thing I recommend changing is your link. You don't need it to code your links. That's just, you know, that's, it. yes, all of them are gonna be different, but you don't actually need that. The only thing that you'll keep open-ended are the text. And that's the part that it's gonna spend most of its time. So you kind of hover over it. It actually gives you that printout of it. If there was anything you accidentally imported from C-SPAN, maybe like one of those program numbers, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I don't really want that in there, you can always choose not to import it at this time. Um, but we've already cleaned up our data set in Excel, so we don't need to do that again. And so we're going to click Next. And this is where the fun begins, because now InVivo is going to do some of the coding for us. Rather than us sitting there and necessarily going through and finding all those themes. Now it's going to do two things. It is going to automatically find common themes in each one of Aja Pai's speeches. And it's also going to code for something called sentiment. Sentiment is how positive or negative um, a person's speech is. So if they're really negative and they're talking about things in negative terminology, it's going to find that. If they're talking about things really positively, like good things, happy things, it's also going to try to find examples of that. So we're going to let it do its magic. We're just going to click finish. 
And it is going to take not that long for all the work that it's doing is to take us weeks to complete, but in vivo magically is going to do this much faster. And once it finishes auto coding both of these things, we are going to see sort of a printout of this. Now, if this takes longer than we have time for here, I actually pre-did this so we can take a look at what it comes up with, but hopefully it finishes this rather quickly. I like to tell students usually when I'm doing this, like this would take you months. So if in vivo takes a couple of weeks, it's gonna, your couple of minutes, like don't panic, but the students don't like that. They, they tend to think that it should go much faster. All right, so let's see our results. We'll close. It's going to be opening up all of his mentions. So that Excel spreadsheet that we uploaded, now it's cleanly visible here. All right, so we get all these different sort of um, outputs. So up here is all the things that it found. So autocode, here's the sentiments, and it's going to tell us what it thinks about his speeches. So it says that uh, when he speaks, oftentimes we see he is moderately negative, moderately positive, and he's a negligible amount of very negative, very positive speeches. And we can click on any one of these and it'll bring up these instances where he, they are claiming that he is very positive or very negative. So it identified that for us, we didn't have to code for sentiment. I will argue that Envivo is one of many tools that auto codes for sentiment. And I think it's really helpful if you're gonna use this in a peer reviewed way to use more than one tool, just compare um, because Sentiment is one of those things that can be interpreted in multiple ways, depending on the programming and how, uh, what key terms it's looking for. So before you just like are like, yes, I did it, sentiment done, publish, just keep in mind that it's helpful to have that secondary analysis to make sure that you're really getting those results. So here we've got an example of him talking about an attack on President Trump. They're claiming that's pretty negative. So you can scroll through and see all those different examples. Let's Let's go through here. So they will also visualize this for us. Um, so these visuals, um, in this case, it's only a it's only a four part visual. But if you had, let's say, 20 different um, ranges in the sentiment analysis, it'll sort of give you a visual readout of what is the most common. And they're saying most commonly, his um, communication is mixed. He's talking both positively and negatively. Not a lot of his speeches are completely negative. Not a lot of his speeches are mostly positive. He's not neutral that often either, which is ironic considering our topic. So you can sort of see some, some examples that are, that are happening there. So automatically we've got a little bit of interest there from our sentiment analysis. This is something you can do, whether it's one speaker or 20 speakers, you can code and compare those sentiments um, using that auto process that was there. Oh, All right. Question, Allison. Yeah, can, sure. Can you import some of the coding that you um, had picked up for the categories yourself into this? You can, absolutely. So um, what you would do is in your previous, um, so we, we would reopen um, the file that we just used, you would export it. Um, and it, you can either export it to look exactly like this, like that table that I showed you, or you can export it as a file that can be then re-uploaded into um, here. So there's two different ways to export. Um, and you just have to do it from the other data set, from the original data set. Um, that's the, the only caveat to it. So we'll go back to Ajit Pai here, his mentions. We just double click and we're back in our 41 cell here um, speeches about him. And you can take a look. If we wanted to, we could do traditional coding just like what we were just doing. So um, for example, we, he, we're going to see him. Um, I believe he talks quite a bit here about partisanship. So we see Democrats writing about partisan rancor. Um, so we could do the same thing we did before, just for a highlight over it. Right, mouse click code, just like what we did, and we could um, add that in. What I think is more interesting is to take a look at what Invivo found. And again, this is a good jumping off point for us. I would not recommend just like taking the auto-coded themes that Invivo found and publishing it as is and saying, these are the themes, these are the dis that appear in there, but it is something that sort of helps us out. So we're gonna go over to our codes here and check out the nodes that were created. And we're gonna click on auto-coded themes. And in our auto-coded themes are all the common things that he says over and over again in his speeches. So we can actually rank them. 
So he talks a lot about spectrum auctions. That was another sort of key set of policies that he um, talked about in his speeches. And keep in mind, this is not a huge data set. It's only 41 mentions of net neutrality. So if you're like, that's not very high, it's not very common. It's within, you know, it's, it's not a quantitative project here. So you can't use it as a percentage outcome from it. So let's, so let's take a look at bipartisan consensus here. And let's take a look at the examples of any time he talks about bipartisan consensus. And so they're gonna identify any time those two words show up together. So you can take a look at his speech there, bipartisan consensus, bipartisan consensus. So essentially what it's doing is it's finding common phrases. And that's what I would say is the limit of in vivo is it's not gonna do the intuitive work of coding like what Juanita did a few minutes ago, which was saying, oh, this is about citizenship. You see how they're implying that? Really, it's just looking for common terminology, but it is a good place to start off because it says, oh, like bipartisanship. Yes, clearly that's something that's showing up quite a bit here. So, <clears throat> So that is another automated thing that um, Invivo can do. Obviously you can ignore this. I mean, you are welcome to use it or you're welcome to say, this is, I'm gonna need to code on my own. This is not gonna be helpful for me, but you can just go back and just do the codes again. So you can do this with any C-SPAN data set that you download from the website, just like what we did with that CSV file. It doesn't have to just be a person, doesn't just have to be a house um, speeches. Usually when I demo this to the class, I give a homework assignment where they have to download a set of speech at some point. And inevitably somebody always tries to download like everything President Obama said during his uh, presidency. And you're like, oh, it's gonna take forever. So I think it's helpful to sort of, you know, parse it down a little bit, especially for in vivo's sake, because if you upload every speech from President Obama, we're talking about hours and hours and hours of upload time. So just keep that as a, as a heads up, especially if you're ever teaching this and it's something that your students are going to be working on independently. As promised, I did want to show one other interesting thing that you can do with in vivo, which has to do with comparing C-SPAN data to other data set sources. Um, and so I think um, probably the best example of this is something that you can do with Twitter. Um, so Aja Pai, when he was chair, um, was very prolific in his digital communication. He tweeted multiple times a day, oftentimes um, about pop culture things, but also about policy issues. And so there's a lot of difference in how he was communicating in that channel and what he was saying to Congress, and which makes sense, right? Different audiences, different styles of speech. But that alone might be of interest for us to study is to see how are they presenting themselves or a policy or something like that, um, specifically in different contexts. And the beautiful thing and the thing that I think is great about in vivo is you can download Twitter data sets with this software and then compare them across what you've already in, uh, imported from C-SPAN. So let's go over to Twitter very quickly here. And we are going to pull up his Twitter account. Now keep in mind, he has not been chair for almost a year at this point. So we would have to go pretty far back if we wanted to just pull up what he said when he was chair. But you can also alternatively pull everything and, and later on delete content. So let's pull up his um, official Twitter account. So you can see already he's got a lot of content here. And one of the things that's nice about Invivo is what comes free when you download it is this plugin. So you have to use Google Chrome in order to access this, but it's an extension called NCAPTURE. And NCAPTURE allows you to download Twitter data sets of any account, any hashtag, uh, anything that you search for, you can download essentially as a file um, that can be uploaded into InVivo. So you just click that button. It's as simple as that. And it's going to pull up capture for InVivo. There's three different ways that you can import it into um, InVivo here. I'm just going to recommend the default setting because it's the easiest to work with. But if you, let's say, uh, we're going to use a different software, you could just download it as a PDF and use that. But this um, these first two are specific to InVivo, you'd only be able to use them. And so we just click capture. That's all we're going to do. Very easy. We are going to try to download everything that Ajit Pai has tweeted, and it's going to do it over the past year. That's basically InVivo's max. 
So if you are someone who's, let's say, studying election data, um, you could do this on election day, look for a certain hashtag, go to NCAPTURE and download whatever people are saying with that hashtag from election day. It does take a few seconds, but as you can see, it just opened itself up here. And we are going to open it in a folder. Now, like I said, the only way to open this file is with in vivo. So you have to save it to your computer and then you can open it up in there. So I'll show you how to do that right now. So we'll pretend as if I just saved it. And we're gonna to go to file. We're gonna do a new project again. Give it a second here. All right, and now we're gonna do All right, so just like what we did before, and we are going to import and it's NCAPTURE data. Um, it's not on our desktop, it is in, where did I save it here? OneDrive, it is in our conference folder. And there it is. So there's the data set that we just took off of um, Twitter and we're gonna import it just like what we just did before. And it's going to pull up everything that he has posted on Twitter. So now that it's in, we can just click it and it's gonna create this really nice spreadsheet for us. So it's gonna basically tell us when he posted it, the tweet that's there, it's going to give us any hashtags that he included in his tweet. Um, if you wanted to access them on the web, you just have to click that. Um, and then a lot of this is just going to be repeated data unless he changed his bio halfway through, which actually in 20, 2021, he did change his bio because he went from being current to former. So um, it might be something of interest if you see somebody who's changing their position a lot. But most likely, this is the one we're interested in, which is the actual tweets. So there's a few things that we can do. We can do the same thing we did before, which is just to do those codes for those nodes. So I could just, you know, if I wanted to code for China here, we just write mouse click code and I can create a new node for China. Alternatively, we can let Invivo do a little bit of the work for us. And so I'm just gonna move things around so I have access to it. Um, and so we have auto coding that we can let it do again. So we can do themes or sentiment, just like what we did. So maybe we wanna see, is he more positive on Twitter or maybe more negative? Because we got differences in our audiences, we know how positive and negative he was on C-SPAN. Let's compare that to what he was doing on Twitter. And so we just say identify sentiment. We'll say probably coding by the sentence in this case. Um, and we'll just click finish. We're gonna give it a few seconds. You can see the progress bar at the bottom if you're ever trying to see is it actually working, you can always check that. Allison, I did have a question. Yeah, of course. Now, actually, there's two questions. Carolyn McCormick had a question saying, do you have oh, sure. connections for other programs to cross code with for sentiment? Um, yes, definitely. The I personally think um, the best one is called Luke. Um, it's linguistic inquiry word count. So not spelt Luke at all. It's L I W C very confusing, but linguistic inquiry word count is another software that you can apply very similarly, um, sentiment analysis to an Excel spreadsheet. So very easy to take something from in vivo, put it into, um, Luke and see if it, um, matches up with that sentiment analysis. That's probably, uh, published wise, there's more published with that sentiment analysis tool than any other on the market. So it's, it's an easy thing to, to assert your reliability with. Okay. And then I had one question about the, what you're doing right now, which is can NCAPTURE be used with the advanced Twitter search? Um, do you mean like looking for a hashtag or? Um, there's like an actual advanced search that Twitter has where you can dig into like by date, by topic. Sure. Yeah, you can do this for any Twitter web page. Um, so if you if you were to search for something more specific or narrow your data set down, it would pull all anything that's on that web page when you search for it. It'll pull what's there. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, I should point out that when it pulled um, Ajit Pai's year long Twitter, he po he posted on Twitter 2,700 times. Just wanted you to keep in mm. mind. 
that is it's a lot of <laughs> posts on Twitter. So that's why it takes a little bit longer for it to analyze it. Um, but what you see here is sort of his autocode. And actually, interesting enough, right, we see some difference, right? According to um, the analysis of his Twitter account, he is a little bit more positive and a little bit more neutral. And look what's the most, what's the smallest compared to C SPAN, mixed was the highest, and now it's the neutral. Um, and mixed is the lowest and positive was one of the smaller categories and now we see you know a little bit more um, positive than the other categories so again not not a statistical comparison but definitely something that if you're a qualitative researcher tells you what to look for it gives you some insight into what might be out there um, and so if you ever want to see it more broken down more cleanly you can always take a look at the numbers um, instead of that sort of visual um, that we were just looking at there we could do the exact same thing that we did before. We could also look for themes. So are there different themes in what he's saying on Twitter versus what he's saying um, in the C-SPAN archives? Um, again, the differences might be pretty minimal in terms of um, the, the terminology that he's using, but it, it gives us a place to start our analysis. So that's something that I think would be an interesting uh, study if somebody wants to do is to compare, it doesn't have to be him, but compare what a speaker on C-SPAN says to what they're posting on Twitter, um, particularly on some of these hot topics that get a lot of audience engagement, we may see a lot of difference in the, that communication. So I'm going to ask Stop my screen right now is we're about 10 minutes to the end. I know I talked quite a bit, but I would be happy to answer questions or demo um, sort of any of these things on a topic that's of more interest to you than net neutrality. Uh, can you uh, read the, the, there's a question from Jennifer oh, that says, does sentiment analysis only work with Excel table format? That's a great question. You can use it on any format. So whether you're importing one by one, like what we did at the beginning, or if it's the Excel spreadsheet, or if it's in Capture from Twitter, it works on any of that. I have one question. Is there any part of this, maybe I missed it, that learns from your coding? Yeah, that's the drawback of in vivo um, that it doesn't. It's not as if you can train it. Um, there are yeah. there are softwares out there. Deduce, which is its major competitor, does have a learning capability to it. Although I will say there's a lot of frustration people have with that. Um, so I don't know. I, I would say we're not really there yet in terms of either one of those softwares doing it extremely well or in a reliable way. But it is it is frustrating that you can't say like, okay, this is an example of uh, partisan, go find me more. Um, it does mm -hmm. not have that capability. Do you have much um, processed already? Um, you know, the, the projects that I've completed, I feel like mm -hmm. um, they're, they're they're pretty, they're done. So, but I, I personally, it's just my own research style. When I feel like I'm at the end of a topic, I don't keep going with it. <laughs> so I haven't pulled net neutrality since 2020. And it's not to say it's not still important and it doesn't still have a lot of discourse happening about it. Um, but you could definitely, um, you know, you could, you could probably keep going with this exact same type of research. One of the other things um, you might look for is like, you could look at Comcast and net neutrality at the same time. Comcast mm -hmm. is probably the organization that gets thrown under the bus the most, whether they deserve it or not, I don't know. But they, you know, in a lot of speeches, people are like, not like that Comcast over there. Um, and so like that in particular in the past year and a half would be an interesting thing to look at. Um, but I just, I haven't done that on this topic. Um, okay, yet. can you... Uh... Can you take a look at the two latest yes. questions that came in? Yes, the relationship um, function in vivo. So you can um, compare some of your findings. Um, so you could compare and find if there's overlaps between um, the speakers in terms of um, what they're using. So you might pair up, um, let's say two senators with each other and that relationship allows you to compare, okay, this one uses this code, this code and this code at the same time, but this one uses this and this. So it almost creates like a Venn diagram for you of those different codes working together. Um, and that's, there's the great thing about that is there's tons of demos of relationship uh, on InVivo. I will point out that I think in the relationship function is actually more helpful 
when you're analyzing um, interviews um, than if you're just doing speeches like what we were talking about today. But it is it's still something that can be applied because it's not necessarily just that going back and forth. You could pick the two speakers that you wanted instead of letting the, the interview tell you who those two speakers are. Okay. And uh, you can only do it when um, you can do it at any time. Yep, you could um, you could do your own analysis. Um, you could do your own coding, and then at the end go in and check for sentiment. Um, so yeah, it doesn't have to be right when you first import it. Um, although that is kind of how it's set up in the um, the the step by step that they show you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? This has been very helpful, and the hands on work that you did is very, uh, very useful for all of us. And uh, I can see, I know uh, one of the things that um, Andrea has talked about doing similar to this workshop is a pedagogy workshop in which we talk about how yeah. people do things for education. And we may have to have you back to yeah. talk about how to, how to design a, a good exercise yeah. So that, that, you know, what, what is it that, well, I ask you that last question. What is it that the students motivate or uh, gravitate to? So the the one project I have, because we I was getting a ton of those President Obama examples. And yeah. I, we're just going to break in vivo if we keep doing this. So <laughs> um, I now have a project where um, they have to look up an organization name in um, CC. And instead of having a specific speaker, it's any time that somebody talks about that organization, um, then they can analyze what is being said about them. If you're that organization, are you happy about what's being said? Are these good sentiments? Are they bad sentiments? So I get some really interesting examples. Like, for example, if you look up Nike in C-SPAN, and I almost always get a student who looks up Nike in C-SPAN, um, over the years, there's been real changes in the sentiment around Nike. So if you were to look in like the, the videos from the 90s and the early 2000s, there's a ton about Nike's labor practices because it was the poster child of making bad labor choices, um, especially mm. internationally. Um, and then if you look more recently, you see obviously a lot more about its social activism work, um, members of Congress in particular, either rallying around that or rejecting that or talking about the free enterprise of that. So I think for students, that's kind of a fun project because they can pick whatever organization that's of interest to them, but they can really see how those discourses change over time and how that might impact public opinion if you're that organization. That, you know, mm -hmm. these the things people say about you are important because it's shaping uh, a lot of times what the customer is eventually going to think of you. Right. Okay, very good. So any, Andrea, do you have any final comments to make? Um, just that we really appreciate uh, Allison taking the time to do this for us as a subject matter expert. So um, if everybody would give her just a virtual bound round of applause on that one. Yeah, very <laughs> good. Um, we do have our upcoming um, session on November 15th. Um, I'm going to pop the screen open real quick. And if you have not had a chance to register for this, please take a moment to uh, look at the workshop title. It's actually going into MTurk. Um, which is the forum where social scientists can work together and collect data. So hopefully we'll see you guys there. Allison, I really, really appreciate you taking the chance or taking the opportunity to do this for us and to um, show our researchers how this works. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. I, I love talking about C-SPAN, so anytime. <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you so much, Allison. Okay. We look forward to seeing everyone. Um, if you have any questions about the C-SPAN video library, please reach out to myself or Dr. Browning, and we'll be mm -hmm. happy to walk through how to use it and to make your research stand out from everybody else's. Yeah, very, and your use of the of the CSV was very helpful to, to show how that tool works. So very good. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you all so much for joining us. <laughs>